when I say to you Peter Parker, what comes to mind? Maybe something like this? courtesy of our immensely talented Pastor Tim Barito. With great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben said that to Peter as he was first beginning to use his new superpowers. And you know the same could be said to us today. We have been given superpowers. We are superheroes as we are learning. And with that power comes a great responsibility and a responsibility to the world around us. Uh, a better word might be ministry, a ministry to the world around us. And that ministry is just as much for you as it is for me. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we can get kind of a, an idea of what this particular ministry is. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Everything is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Now, every time you see the word reconciled or reconciliation in this particular passage, and we've underlined them in your sermon notes, it's the same Greek word. It's katalasso. Now, we'll get to that in a little bit, but I want you to know that as we go through this, um, it's the same word. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Stop. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the ministry of reconciliation. That is your ministry, and we're going to find out what that is in a minute. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Would you underline that or circle that if you're taking notes? Not counting the world's sins against them. He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. We are ambassadors for Christ. We plead or we beg on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, back to the word reconciled or reconciliation in that passage. It's all from the same root word, Catalasso in the Greek. And catalasso means to exchange for equivalent value. So if that's our ministry, God's committed the ministry of reconciliation to you and I. If that's our ministry, then what's it look like? Well, what it looks like partially is that we need to be speaking to the world First and foremost, that God exchanged Jesus for them equally. That's our primary message to the world. 
do you know that God exchanged Jesus for you equally? And for me, that is a wow. I, I can't even fathom that. I have three children. I would not exchange any of them equally for you. Don't mean to be harsh. I'm just telling you, even though I love you, I wouldn't exchange any of my children equally for you, especially if you were my enemy. And that's precisely when God exchanged Jesus equally for you and I, when we were his enemy. So this, this ministry of reconciliation is to tell the world that and to tell the world that God is no longer counting their sins against them. How many times do we do that? When, when we talk to people, whether it's in an evangelism or a discipleship or whether it's to our family and friends who don't know Jesus, how many times do we tell them, you know what, God's not counting your sins against you anymore? How much more often do we focus on the sins? And as we're evangelizing for NAVs or crew or FCA or talking to our family, how much do we, time do we spend telling them, if you don't quit drinking and sleeping around, God's going to punish you? How many times do we do that? A lot. And you pick the sin, it doesn't really matter. That seems to be our focus when we evangelize, that God is a God of judgment and wrath, and God is going to punish you for your sins. But that passage just said that God is no longer counting the sins of the world against them. So how do you reconcile those two things? You don't. So our first ministry, this ministry of reconciliation, is to tell people, number one, that God exchanged Jesus for you equally, and number two, to tell them he's no longer counting your sins against you anymore. So what do we want them to do? We plead with them. We beg them, be reconciled to God. We beg them to do what? To receive the restoration of God's favor to those who put their trust in the expiatory death of Christ. If you remember the New Covenant series, we talked about expiation and propitiation. Expiation or expiatory death of Christ just means to make holy. It means the removal of sin. So what did the death of Christ do? It removed sin. And who did it remove sin for? The whole world. Everyone. Whether they've received it or not, yes. We're not judged on our sins anymore. The entrance or non-entrance into heaven or hell is found in John 3, 16 through 18. Jesus says, everyone who believes has been saved. Everyone who does not believe is condemned. The issue isn't sin anymore. The issue is belief or unbelief. So our issue and our job is to plead with people, to beg with people, please put your trust in the death of Christ. Stop trusting in other things. But before you can tell them that effectively, what do you have to do? You have to tell them that God exchanged Jesus for them equally. And you have to tell them that he's no longer counting their sins against them anymore. That's an effective ministry. Why do I say that? Because that's what the Bible says. If you look at the other part of expiation and you look at propitiation, what does that mean? 1 John 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, finish the sentence for me. For who? The whole world. The whole world. John's speaking to Christians, so that's why he says ours, not only for our sins, but then he says the whole world, non-Christians. Jesus is the propitiation for sins for the whole world. Look at 1 John 4. Love is this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. So what's propitiation mean? According to Ryrie's basic theology, it is that by which it becomes consistent with God's character and government to pardon and bless the sinner. It renders it consistent for God to exercise his love towards sinners. What renders it consistent with God? What is consistent with his character and government to bless the sinner, the death of Jesus. Jesus' death did that. So when we begin to understand this, we can tell the world that what, is God can, what God can legally do, what God 
can do consistently with his character and government, he can pardon and bless the sinner. It literally means to make favorable. It includes the idea of dealing with God's wrath against sinners. That's your ministry, folks. I, I don't care what organization you belong to or if you don't belong to any other parachurch or church organizations. If you're talking to your uncle, if you're talking to your cousin, if you're talking to your brother or your mom and dad or your children, this is your ministry. And it's the ministry for all of us. And unfortunately, many of us have missed this ministry. So it's time to reclaim what the Word of God says. And it's time to operate under this ministry of reconciliation and, and plead and beg with the world to put their trust in the death of Christ. And now what happens? Now God can pardon and bless the sinner because of what Jesus has done and because they've put their trust in him. And you might say, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. I can't do that. Yes, you can. You've already been given the power and the ability to do that. It's called grace. Look at Acts 1.8. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. If you're a believer in here with us today, has the Holy Spirit come upon you? Yep. In fact, even better than that, he lives inside you. So guess what you have? Power. Ephesians 1 tells us how much power. The immeasurable. Can you measure immeasurable? You have been given an immeasurable greatness of power. And who's that power available to? To us who believe. Do you believe in Jesus? Have you been given power? Yes. Yep, it's already yours. Just don't know it, or you may not believe it. Now remember, power is dunamis in the Greek. It's the power for performing miracles. Do you know what the greatest miracle is? Receiving salvation. That's the greatest miracle there is. So if you've received this power for performing miracles, what is it? Well, it's the ministry of reconciliation to help get people to trust in the death of Jesus Christ for salvation. And how do you do that? You help them understand that God exchanged Jesus for them equally and God is not counting their sins against them anymore. That's how you do it. And that power has been given to you. And that power is is residing in a thing according to its nature. Pastor, I still don't understand. Well, look at what dunamis means, the power residing in a thing according to its nature. Whose nature do you have? Colossians 2 tells us that in him the entire fullness of God's nature dwells. In who? In Jesus. But you have been filled by him. So whose nature is in you? God's. God's very nature is in you. That's what gives you the power. It isn't us. It isn't me, it isn't you with that ability or that power. Who is our superpower? The Holy Spirit. That's the superpower that we've all been given. And that power gives us the ability to perform the message of reconciliation. You can serve in the nursery, you can sing on the worship team, you can preach, you can pray, you can evangelize, you can disciple. Do you know those are just tools? Those are just tools, folks. They're just tools to do what? to perform the ministry of reconciliation. That's how you do it. But all those things, all the acts of service is just a tool. And that tool leads us to the ministry of reconciliation. So you have this superpower and it's inside you. So let's find out today a little bit about the source of this power, okay? Let's pray first. Father, thank you so much. We get to come today and hear about Jesus. It doesn't matter what other things are going on in our life today. There is no better place to be than here at this moment, at this time. So we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the power that he's already given us, the power that leads and guides us into the truth and the truth about Jesus Christ. And we open our hearts and receive that in his holy and precious name. Amen. As we've been exploring grace and exploring this ability there's been questions asked, well, okay, what do I do? And what am I supposed to be like? And the beauty of that statement is, is that as we are transformed into the very image of Christ, as I look out as, at my own mirror image here, and I'm transformed into the very mirror image of myself, I would then do things like myself, right? So if you're transformed into the image of Christ, 
you would be a server, you'd be a giver, you'd be a sacrificer, you'd be a prayer, because that's the image that you've been transformed into. So if we're like looking to try to find out what to do and who to be like, Jesus is the perfect example of that, because that's the image we want to be transformed into. So Jesus then becomes our perfect example. So how is Jesus our perfect example? How did he do the things that he did? John 1 tells us he was full of grace and truth. And look at this. Jesus was full of grace and truth, but we have received grace after grace from his fullness. So we have already received that. That's past tense. Jesus was full of this grace and truth, and now we have received that same grace, that same ability from his fullness. John 13, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Now, the context of that in John 13 is foot washing. There's a larger context, and the larger context is if we want to know what to do, look to Jesus' life and see what he has done. He's given us an example of that. John 14, if you know me, you will also know my father. Stop. There is an erroneous teaching in Christianity especially, and not just Christianity, but sometimes the world. And, and we look at Jesus over here, and we say, well, Jesus, man, he was a really nice guy. He was kind, and he was full of mercy, and he treated people so well, and he had all kinds of love. And then we have this view of our Heavenly Father, and we think our Heavenly Father is a God of, of anger and judgment and wrath. Agree? Where did we get that view? I have no idea. That is absolutely not true. You can see it from this passage. Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father. Jesus says, guess what? If you know and you see me, you've seen the Father. We have this, this picture of a God the Father who somehow puts sickness upon us and he puts difficulties and trials and, and, and temptations in our life, and he says, you did something wrong, I want to punish you. Where do you ever see Jesus doing that? Do you ever see Jesus walking down the street going, oh, you're too healthy, poof, have some sickness? We never see that. And so if you're trying to find out what God the Father is like, just look to Jesus. And what's the Bible say about Jesus? He healed them all. He healed them all. So what's your heavenly father want to do? Heal them all. So if we're trying to find out what God the Father is like, just look to Jesus. That's why he came. So the Bible says, if you know me, you will also know my father. There isn't a separation between the two. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Why? Because they've seen Jesus. The one who has seen me has seen the father. And then look at this next part. Believe me. Now, Jesus was also called what? The Word. Believe the Word that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So believe what you see in your Bible. Believe the Word of God. And th th I got an email this week, kind of a, oh, not the nicest email I've ever gotten. In, in that email, a person was disagreeing with this message of grace. They were disagreeing with the word. That's fine. And Jesus, Jesus tells us that. If you don't believe me, what's he say? Believe because of the works themselves. Believe because you see testimony after testimony after testimony. You hear testimony after testimony after testimony. You see the signs and wonders that follow the preaching of grace with your own eyes or in the lives of the people around you. So if you don't believe in the word of God, believe because of the works that you see. Believe because of lives that you see changed in this church. Believe because of the miracles and the signs and wonders that we see constantly here week after week after week. If you don't believe the word, believe because of the works themselves. So it's important for us to understand that Jesus did all of the things he did as a man full of grace, not as God. If he did all the miracles as God, if he had victory over sin and victory over temptation as God, he couldn't be a perfect example to us, 
right? If all of those wonderful things he did, he did as God, he couldn't be a perfect example to us because we are not God. And we never will be God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus became flesh. He became a man. John 1, the word, which is Jesus, became flesh. Hebrews 4, he is one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. He became a man. If you don't believe that Jesus was fully man, it will limit what God can accomplish in you. Let me say that again. If you don't believe that Jesus is fully man, he's also fully God, but if you don't believe that he was fully man, it will limit what God can accomplish in you because Jesus' humanity is precisely what gives us the perfect example of our hope for victory. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does that victory come from? This is powerful. I just blew me away when I saw this verse this week. 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory. So where would the victory come from? Jesus. How's the victory come? This is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. Or our belief. Faith and belief are synonymous. So how this victory that Jesus Christ has won for us, how is it manifest in your life through your belief? That's how you achieve the victory that's overcome the world. The victory comes through Jesus, but we manifest it in our lives by believing. If you believe that Jesus performed miracles because he was God, you never will. Because you are not and will never be God. You must believe that Jesus operated as a man full of grace, full of ability, before you will be able to believe that you also are a man or woman full of power to perform miracles. Now, have we already established that? That you have a power to perform miracles in your life? We've already established that. But if you don't believe that, what did 1 John 5 say? You'll never achieve the victory because the victory comes through your belief. You know, this isn't a new issue. This issue about Jesus being a man it is not a new issue. It's 2,000 years old. The Apostle John addressed the same issue 2,000 years ago. 1 John chapter 4. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not from God. There were people back then, just like today, who said Jesus was not man. Jesus was just God. And he came down as God. And he did everything as God. And the, the primary group of people who was talking about this were a group of people called the Gnostics. And, and they were mixing the Jewish religion with paganism. And one of their beliefs was that Jesus did not become a man. So John addresses that. And he says, if you say that Jesus did not become flesh, you're not from God. The Bible says that Jesus was a man who was anointed with power by God. Look at Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus. He anointed. Anointed in the Greek is creo. Creo means to furnish with necessary powers. Stop. If Jesus operated as God, does he need to be furnished with necessary powers? Mm -mm. Creo also means to empower with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus operated as God, does he need to be empowered with the gifts of the Holy Spirit? No. So look what the Bible says. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Power is what? Dunamis the power for performing miracles, and it's the power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. What did Colossians 2 tell us earlier? That in him the entire fullness of God's nature dwells. So because Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with power, have you been anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power? Yes. 
Jesus went about doing good and healing how many? All who were under the tyranny, tyranny or oppression, tyranny or oppression of the devil. Why did he do that? Because God was with him. So that verse isn't true if Jesus did all those things as God. If he was God, he didn't need to be furnished with power. But that's the point. He was not operating as God. He was operating as a man living under grace. As a man living under grace. Now please understand, what we've done here today is, is we have taken experience and tradition and we've set them aside. Because I know I'm stepping on some toes. I know I'm stepping on some toes of experience and tradition who are thinking, where are you getting this? Straight from the word of God. So we have to decide in our lives, are we going to allow the word of God to dictate our life or are we going to allow our experience and tradition? I can't make that choice for you. And as we talk about this, and as we talk about Jesus being fully man, it does not take one single thing away from his divinity. Not one single thing. He was fully man and fully God. So as we talk about this, Jesus chose to empty himself. He chose to become a man living under grace, even though he was grace itself. (laughs) Look at what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Think with me this way. Think if you were a prince. You got some advantages of being the child of the king? And the advantages of being the child of the king would remain as long as you were a prince, as long as you were a child of the king. But if you decided to remove yourself from the kingdom and reject your powers and reject your authority, you would not be doing that for your own advantage, would you? You'd be doing that for someone else. And that's precisely what Jesus did. He left aside his kingship for you. And God exchanged him, the king exchanged him For equal value. Can you imagine being in a kingdom and you've done something wrong and the crime was punishable by death? And the king said, instead of you going to the gallows, I'm going to send my son, the prince. That's exactly what God did for you. He exchanged Jesus for you as equal value. So believe me, this wasn't for his own advantage unless you understand that the advantage was God loved you so much. And God loves the world so much that he did this. So not for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Don't ask me how he did it. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand how the very God of all creation empties himself and becomes a man. I don't know. I don't understand it. Our question is, are you going to believe it because you understand it, or are you going to believe it because that's what the Word of God says? And that's a choice that you'll make. I believe it because that's what the Word of God says, but I do not understand it. I cannot understand that kind of love. I cannot understand it. But that's what the Bible says happened. So why is all this important? Because your belief or unbelief in this area is crucial to whether or not you will live in victory over the devil or be defeated by him. Is that important? Your belief or unbelief in this area is the key to all of that. Look back to John chapter 14. The truth is, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works. That verse is not true if Jesus did all the things he did as God. You with me? If Jesus did all the things he did as God, that verse is not true because I'm not and never will be God, neither will you. 
And we all know the Bible is completely 100% true. There are no contradictions in your Bible. It's either all true or none of it's true. But that verse can't be true if Jesus did all the things he did as God. So what's the answer? The answer is Jesus did all the things he did as a man living under grace. And if he did, it gives us great hope. Because now John chapter 14 becomes true in our life. When you look at the life of Jesus and you look at John chapter 5 and John chapter 8, Jesus says the son is not able to do anything on his own. Now, stop for a second. If he was God, couldn't he do some stuff on his own? But that's the point. He's not operating as God. So Jesus himself says the son can't do anything on his own. Only what he sees the father doing. John chapter 5. I do nothing on my own. Just as the father taught me, I say these things. Jesus always gave glory and honor and credit and praise to his Father. It wasn't his ability. So if it wasn't his ability, where did he get it? John chapter 1, he was full of what? Grace and truth. Acts chapter 10, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. You've been filled with grace and truth? Bible says you have. Have you been anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power? Bible says you have. So why aren't we seeing the greater works that the Bible promises us? Luke chapter 2. As Jesus grew, he became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. As Jesus grew, he grew in wisdom. Remember where we said wisdom comes from? Only from God. And as he grew in this wisdom from God, what did he begin to do? He began to live under grace. And as he began to live under grace, he began to understand the depths of the power of the Holy Spirit within him. Wow. You're a superhero. And you've got superpowers that you may not yet be using. You know, as we talk about Spider-Man, Spider-Man had more than one power, didn't he? He had strength. He had speed, he had agility, he had an awareness. So as we talk about this grace ability, understand it's more than just one thing. We've been kind of concentrating on the power to perform miracles. There's another area of power that Jesus had, and it was the power over sin. The power over sin. 2 Corinthians 5, he made the one who did not know sin. Hebrews 4, one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. 1 Peter 2, he did not commit sin. 1 John 3, he was revealed so he might take away sins. There is no sin in him. Jesus was tempted with sin just like us. My wife brought this to my attention. The Holy Spirit had, had revealed this to her after second service. If Jesus was operating as God, he couldn't be tempted. Because James 1.13 says God cannot be tempted with evil. So he can't be tempted if he's God. Isn't that cool? So he's got to be operating as a man living under grace. Can't be operating as God if he's tempted. And what does the Bible say? He was tempted in every way just like we are. This was not a fake temptation. This was absolutely real. His flesh desired things that were not the will of his father. Some people say, oh, Jesus wasn't tempted like we are. The Bible says that we are. He's tempted in every way. Was he tempted by the little girl down the street, down the village? Yeah. Was he tempted to lie? Yes. Was he tempted to steal? Yes, he had to be, because that's what the Bible says. So set aside the experience and tradition and look and see what the Bible says. And it says he was tempted in every way, just as we are. You know, if the temptation was real, so was his ability to sin. Jesus could have sinned just like you and I. But he had power over sin because we see he didn't sin. Again, if he was operating as God, that doesn't give us any hope because we're not God. So he had to be living as a man under grace. He had to have power over sin 
some other way than just because he was God. So how did he do it? Hebrews chapter 4. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations that we do, yet he did not sin. Therefore, stop. Anybody remember what therefore is there for? Or what you do when you see a therefore? Therefore, in your Bible means look back to see what it's there for. So keep reading. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why would we come boldly to the throne of grace when we face temptations? Jesus, when he faced these temptations like we do, what did he do? Came boldly to the throne of grace. There, we will receive his mercy and find grace to help us when we need it. Again, I'm saying this four or five or six times because I want you to understand it. If Jesus had power over sin just because he was God, we have no hope. If Jesus had power over sin just because he was God, we will never experience victory over sin because we are not and never will be God. But if he was fully man, if he emptied himself of his divinity, if he came in the flesh, then he must have received the power over sin some other way. How? Go back to verse 16 in Hebrews 4. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You notice it's not the throne of judgment. It's the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace. And what happens when we do that? We find grace to help us in our time of need. When Jesus was in need, when he was tempted. Now remember, he's not tempted as God, right? Can't be. God's not tempted by evil. Can't be God. So he's got to be a man living under grace. And he is living as this man under grace, and he's tempted. He's in need. What's he do? When he agonized in the flesh as we do. I don't know about you. There are times in my life when, when sin and a temptation has had such a power over me that I've literally been in agony. It literally feels like there is a wrestling match going on inside me. That's Romans chapter 7. <laughs> and it literally feels like I'm being pulled apart because I, I have this thing over here that I don't want to do, but it doesn't seem like I can stop doing it. And I have this thing over here that I do want to do, but it doesn't seem like I have the ability to do it. It is an agony. And Jesus faced the same agonies that you and I did, had to. Bible tells us he did. So what did he do? When he was in agony and was tempted with that sin, he went to his father. And he received the ability that he needed for victory. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, since he himself has gone through suffering temptation, he is able to help us when we are being tempted. And Luke 22 says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. At that moment, did Jesus want to go through what he was going to go through on the cross? No. His flesh was screaming out, Father, I don't want to do this. And so what did he do? He went to the throne of grace, and he received help. And he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Don't think for one minute it wasn't a struggle for him. In fact, I think it was a bigger struggle for him than it is for us because he had the sins of the whole world he was dealing with. So there was an agony and a struggle and a temptation. But as he grew, as he gained wisdom to approach the throne of grace, whenever he had a need, he received the ability to conquer sin's power. And you might say, well, Pastor, that's Jesus. That's not me. I, I, I don't believe I will ever have the power to conquer sin. Then you never will. Where's the victory come from? Our faith. Or belief. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Don't ever, don't ever miss those three words, in this world. They are crucial to that passage. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that sin will not rule over you. Do you know, there are some of you in here today, there, there are many Christians and there are sin that's ruling over them. There's a sin that they've been dealing with for years and years and years and years. 
and they never seem to be able to, to defeat that sin. And they finally give up and say, I, I, I can't do that. That sin is going to rule over me all of my life. The Bible says that's not supposed to be so. The Bible says that sin will not rule over you. It will not have dominion over you. It will not have authority over you. When does that happen? When you're living under grace. When you live your life under grace, like Jesus did, that sin does not rule over you. What happens with grace? When we receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness, we will reign in life through Christ Jesus. We will have authority. We will have the right to rule. When you begin to receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness, as much and as many times and as often as you need it, you will begin to reign. You will begin to have the right and authority to rule through what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. Do you know that victory and peace and power, they're, they're not only within your reach, they should be normal for you. That's what you should expect in your life. How does that come? To the grace and the ability of God just like it did for Jesus. But you've got to learn to receive that grace daily, to receive the overflow of ability that comes from the Holy Spirit because he is the source of your power. You, you can live with victory over sin. You were meant to. In fact, it is your destiny to live in victory over sin through the power of grace. You can change. And you can become transformed into the very image of Christ. We're going to take some time now and just open up our altars for prayer. If there's anything that you're dealing with right now that you would need prayer for, would you just come forward? My wife and I will be up front to assist you in your prayers. We hope you have an incredibly wonderful day. And next week we're going to talk about how this deliverance from sin happens. I hope you join us. See you later. Thank you.